Okay, so it's Sunday, December 16th, and Saturday, December 15th, at 5.30 at Dave and Connie's house, is Young at Heart. There'll be soup and games. I'm sure that'll be fun. Hopefully, there's nobody's like a roof. Do you guys play roof? You guys play roof? Okay. They can be kind of, you know, intense. <laughs> and then also next Sunday, December 16th, will be our Let's Adore Christmas program. You'll want to come. It'll be great. Um, we'll get to, get to hear children sing, teens sing, and lots of, lots of music. Christmas Eve service will be December 24th at 5.30. That's here, and we are combining with Village, com village Community and Lovely, correct? Awesome. So we'd love to see you at that service as well. Um, we could have the ushers come and we'll take our offering. Lord, we thank you for this day. And we thank you for your bountiful blessing. Father, I pray that you would move this to stay. Be with the gift and giver. May we trust him and use for your glory, Lord. We ask it all in your son's name. Amen. Amen.
continue our worship as we sing together about this Advent season, this great season. Oh. Jesus' birth. 
fill our hearts with love for one another, that through us all may see the love of Christ and come to know him by our example. Amen. <coughs>
come and lead us in prayer this morning. And so if you need to come to these altars this morning to whatever burdens you're carrying, or maybe it's a, something to rejoice in the Lord, maybe an answer to prayer, whatever the case is, these altars are open for you to come and share your, your burdens with the Lord. Stumble group of people. Anyhow, once told a group of people that uh, if we have nothing to ask God for, we have a lot to praise Him for. And I do believe that, but I know today we, we live in a needy world. We are needy people. But I hope most of all we are thankful people. Our dear Heavenly Father, I come humbly before your throne. Lord, I don't have any answers. I don't have answers for the needy. But I know a God that does. And Father, you do. And Father, I know on the dark nights, we don't see the light. But we can rest assured that you are there and you are the light. you. We want to praise you for so much. Lord, we may be needy. We may hurt this morning. <clears throat> Father, we may be in pain that no one can imagine. That only you can feel. You said you feel us. You feel for us. You know as we walk through the valleys. Father, we prefer to stay on the mountaintops to have the praises roll off our lips. And Father, we come into a season that in a lot of ways we can set some of the problems aside for a moment and remember you and remember the real gift that you gave us that's not wrapped in sparkling paper under a tree. It's not sitting on a door shelf. Father, it's came in a manger. The most unexpected place. But Lord, you came. And you set an example for us. Father, you came to meet the needs of the world. And you came because you love the world. And Father, that, that gift you in that manger it goes to us that even now, even in the roughest place that Mary and Joseph were in, they, they were staying a night in a barn. But there you were. Well, we may be going through, we may be going through something that even that terrible, maybe worse, but you're there. We may not be able to see you, Lord, and we're sorry that our eyes aren't open wide enough sometimes to see you. Lord, with Jeremiah, we remember the hope. Even in the midst of devastation, we remember the hope. And Father, you are the hope. We bless those that are around the altar, those who are sitting in the, in the seats, Lord, that are, that are carrying burdens beyond our comprehension. Father, that you would touch. And then, Father, we would, we would give you praise and honor and glory when we ask all things, Lord Jesus, in your name. Amen.
Good to see you. It was good back there. And thank you all again for, for putting up with me in this uh, endeavor as we uh, or you pray for us as we're in the in the process of seeking or asking for God's direction on a worship pastor. And so in the meantime, you just got to put up with me. So I'm sorry about that. I tried to get some others to, no, no, we can't do that. Anyway, but we'll, uh, we'll make it, right? We'll make it together. But, well, thank you. At least I have one fan. That's always awesome. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, and I, I do trust and pray that you are being in prayer and maybe learning to cultivate a life of prayer. We talked about this in our men's breakfast yesterday morning and uh, before. Uh, that God is calling us back to prayer. We can't do without that. Amen. And we can't do too much prayer, right? In fact, we, we don't do it enough. So, and holding each other accountable. When you see something that you have a question about, go to the person and ask them about it. You know, in a loving way, not in a, you know, browbeating way. Or, you know, ask them about it. I, 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 I just believe God's not through with us. That's right. Well, all of us. So there's a reason. That he has us here. And we will seek that out. Amen? Amen. We will seek it before he is. Well, I invite you this morning, Luke's Gospel, chapter 3. Beginning in verse 1. Uh, let's stand together, if you will, please. We read from God's Word together this morning. In honor of his word. Luke, chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, Herod, tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip, tetrarch of Ituria, and Trachonitis, and Asanias, tetrarch of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. And he went into all the country around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. Every valley shall be filled in, every mountain and hill made low. The crooked road shall become straight, the rough way smooth, and all people will see God's salvation. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's recite our motto together, shall we? Once again. All together, Heavenly Father, I give you permission to speak to me, to speak through me, to do whatever you want in my life. I trust the leadership of your Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Well, it's, it's said to be a true story, so I just have to take that it is. It's about a group of Apache Indians who attacked a cavalry unit and successfully captured the paymaster's safe. They'd never seen a safe before, but they knew it contained precious gold, or they were pretty sure. They tried to open the safe, but they were unsuccessful. They, they beat it with their tomahawks. They dragged it over the ground with their horses. They heated it on fire. They, they tried to blast it with gunpowder. Finally, they dropped it off a cliff into a great ravine. And in spite of all their best efforts, the safe did not open. Finally, they gave up and they left it behind. Later, the, the army found this abandoned safe. And the paymaster immediately rushed to it turned the combination a few times and within just a few minutes had it open. What the Apaches had been unable to accomplish with all their extravagant efforts, the paymaster accomplished 
in just a few moments of time was just the twist of his wrists and fingers. Why? Well, because he knew the combination. <laughs> Some things are like that. Aren't they? Some things are just like that. We, we can't penetrate them as hard as we try. We can't get through it until we find someone is found who knows the combination. Well, 400 years before Christ, Plato, the great Greek philosopher, sought to penetrate the mystery of reality. And he, he described the human condition like this. Humanity is imprisoned in a cave. He's shackled in a world from which he cannot escape. He wears blinders so that his perspective is limited to what is directly in front of him. Before him are only the shadows of real objects. Given these restraints, he is able to view only a small part of reality to comprehend a tiny fraction of truth. Hmm. No wonder Plato's name lives even today. His was a brilliant recognition of the human situation before the coming of Christ. Plato taught that all humanity can see on its own are shadows in a dark cave. And it's true. All humanity can see on its own are shadows in a dark cave. Plato was a great philosopher, but even the simplest Christian believer has an advantage over this noble Greek. The simplest Christian believer knows that into that dark cave of the human condition, God has shown a wondrous light. Even the simplest Christian knows and understands that. That, of course, is what Advent and Christmas is all about. That's exactly what Advent and Christmas is all about. The ancient theologian Origen tried to simplify the, the message of this season of the years with something like this. He said, suppose there were a statue, a statue so large that the human eyes simply could not take it all in with one look. How could we ever grasp the essential form and substance of this statue so big that you can't, you just can't take it all in with one look? Of course, Origen, he, he could not imagine a world of drones that could fly overhead and take pictures of that giant statue. Origen's imagined solution was to make a small copy of this giant statue to an exact scale, but much reduced. Then he said humanity could see what the greater statue was like. Origen went on to say that this is exactly what God has done in Jesus Christ. And that is what John the Baptist, the forerunner of Jesus, was trying to tell everyone about. That God, through Jesus, shows us what He Himself is like within the bounds of our human ability to understand. That's what this is all about. That's what Advent is all about. That's what Christmas is all about. That's what Origen, the great theologian, was trying to say. That's what John the Baptist, the forerunner of Jesus, was trying to preach to everyone. That God, through Jesus, shows us what He Himself is like within the bounds of our own human ability to understand. So, Here's the first story. I have four of them that are listed there. It's not, I hope I don't take four times as long, but the, the first story is truth about Advent and Christmas is this. God has come down in Jesus Christ. 
God has come down in Jesus Christ. You see, Christ is an exact replica of God reduced to human size. The exact replica, Christ is, the exact replica of God reduced to human size. Amen. A man by the name of Al Lindgren was a professor at the Garrett Evangelical Seminary. He was telling a story about taking his junior high school son fishing years ago. He said it was one of those days when, well, the fish just weren't biting. And so the two of them had a lot of time to talk. And he said just out of the blue, this junior high boy asked, Dad, what do you think is the toughest thing God ever tried to do? What's the toughest thing you think God ever tried to do? <laughs> well, even as a minister, Al Lundgren said that the question kind of caught him off guard. He, he didn't know what, what to say. And so like any good teacher, he answered a question. And he said, well, what do you think it was, son? He asked him. And his, his son responded like my kids do. Even though you're a minister, you don't know much about God, do you, Dad? <laughs> and then the boy proceeded to answer his own question, and he said it like this. He said, since taking science in school, I, I thought the creation of the world might be the hardest thing God ever tried to do. Then he said, in Sunday school, we got to talking about some of the miracles like Jesus' resurrection. And I thought that that might be the toughest thing that God ever did. And then after thinking some more and talking to some others, I, I decided that no one really knows God very well. So now I think the toughest thing God ever tried to do is to get us to understand who He is and that He really loves us. <laughs> wow. Out of the mouths of babes, right? <clears throat> Al Ingram could simply say back to his boy, he said, Son, I think you're right. That is the hardest thing that God ever had to do. And there is only one way He could do it. Only one way. And how is that? We might ask. God has come down in Jesus Christ. That's the good news of the gospel this morning. Why did God come down? Because that was the only way He could reveal Himself to us. The only way He could reveal. He had to come down. And He did. So God came down. The second thing, God humbled Himself in our behalf. God humbled Himself in our behalf. Yeah, that's the second thing we need to see. God humbled Himself. There was an interesting article in uh, a national magazine several years ago about a former Alabama football player, since football is kind of keen right now, you know, and Alabama kind of seems to have a, have a grip on the college football circle. I thought this story might be relevant. But uh, in this magazine, the former football player... Um, some of you might remember his name was John Croyle. He was a devout Christian. He started a ranch in 1975 called the Big Oak Boys Ranch. And over the years, that ranch has taken in more than 2,000 homeless and unwanted and abused boys. In fact, when I was researching that, I, I discovered that he has averaged, John Coral has averaged since he's opened that ranch till now, averaged 19 or 20 kids that he's paid to go to college. Every year. Anyway, that, that's beside the point. 13 years later, the Big Oak Girls Ranch was added. The Girls Ranch evolved from a court case involving a girl by the name of Shelley, a 12-year-old girl who had been physically and sexually abused by her father. And the folks at the Big Oak Ranch pleaded with the judge to, to let Shelley live at the boys' ranch, but the judge refused to place Shelley there and placed her back with her parents. And Shelley was beaten to death by her parents three months later. 
The girls' ranch was built in 1988 in Shelley's memory of the Big Oak Ranch. John Coyle once said that he has seen hundreds of miracles among those boys and girls. And at the ranch, the children are exposed to faith, love, and hard work. Never heard anybody did it. Over the years, uh, Crawl has received a lot of help from football friends like the great coach Bear Bryant and a lot of other NFL uh, superstars and dignitaries. John Crawl married his uh, childhood sweetheart. Her name was T. I like that. John and T. And at the time of this uh, magazine article, they lived in a small farmhouse at the Big Oak Ranch. And he said, the boys at the ranch know that I love them. He said, because I live in a smaller house than they do. <laughs> that statement just kind of stuck out to me. Because so often servants of God seek to live like royalty. You might remember some stories and press releases not too long ago and talking about famed media preachers who live in 10,000 square feet, multi-million dollar houses. It would really be interesting to see what kind of sermon they preach, they'd be able to deliver on the subject of missions. But the boys, the boys say they know I love them, said John Coyle, because I live in a smaller house than they do. <laughs> and, and by the way, today, Coyle has actually turned over he and his wife have retired and they've turned over the ranch to their son, Brody Croyle, who was also former quarterback at Alabama and also a quarterback for the Kansas City Chiefs in 2006 with the Chiefs. Back then, who now Brody has retired as well and has taken over the leadership of the ranch and along with his sister, his family. It just reminded me of this truth. That God needed to communicate His love to us, and so He humbled Himself. God needed to communicate His love to us, so He humbled Himself. He moved into a smaller, a house smaller than ours. Think about that. He moved into a house smaller than ours. A manger, some straw, some sheep, and some shepherds were just the thing. Maybe the little town of Bethlehem was the only place that that could have happened. Of course, we, you know, if looking in from our human standpoint, we would have had our son born in Rome or in Athens or at least in Jerusalem, right? We, we would have done that, but no, not God. The little town of Bethlehem would do just fine. There was a small, a small book from Doubleday. Um, some of you might be familiar with the title of it was Dear God. It's a collection of children's letters to God. Yeah. I don't know if you remember that book, but if you haven't, you might want to look it up. It's, <coughs> you, you'll find it very interesting. In, in, this, in this book, one of the letters in this one young man wrote, Dear God, was there anything special about Bethlehem or did you just figure that that was just as good a place as any to start a franchise? <laughs> and he signed it, your friend Jim, age 12. <laughs> I like that. Was there anything special about Bethlehem or did you just figure that was just as good a place as any to start a franchise? Well, obviously God thought that was the best place on earth to start a franchise, right? God humbled Himself and came into a stable and a manger among cattle and sheep and donkeys and shepherds in the tiny town of Bethlehem in order to communicate to us His love and His purpose. He did it. Humbled Himself. God has come down in Jesus Christ. God humbled Himself in our behalf. Those are the first two things about Advent and Christmas. But here's the third. 
Humanity has been lifted up. Humanity has been lifted up. You see, even though you and I are unworthy of any action on God's part, God came down that we might be lifted up. When Jesus of Nazareth was born in Bethlehem of Judea, all of us were raised to a new level. Amen. God has come down. Humanity has been lifted up. I read an interesting story here not too long ago. It was about the famous French Arthur Balzac. And he fancied himself to be an expert in interpreting handwriting. And he believed that he could... He could determine the character of a person just by analyzing the way they write. So one day this little old lady brought him a, a little boy's homework book and asked this great writer, Balzac, and his expert on handwriting, asked him to give his opinion of this child's potential in this homework book. Balzac studied very carefully this irregular, untidy script and then he asked the little old lady, are, are you this boy's mother? The lady said, no. He said, well, perhaps you're related to him at least. No way, not at all, she said. Okay, well then I'm just going to tell you frankly. This young person who wrote in this book is very slovenly and probably stupid. And probably won't really amount to very much. Ha ha ha, said the woman. <laughs> it might surprise you to know, Mr. Balzac, that this notebook was your notebook when you were a boy at school. <laughs> Season of 
gift giving. One of the most popular gifts in stores today is gift cards. Gift cards. And research shows that 39.2% of shoppers will purchase a department store gift card for their friends or family. Followed by 33.4% of shoppers opting for restaurant gift cards. Nothing wrong with that, but I like to eat, right? That's good. Uh, Susie and I have been able to enjoy quite because of what you all give us gift cards. It's wonderful. We, we enjoy You can tell I'm starving to death. <laughs> <laughs> but according to estimates reported in the Journal of State Taxation, the typical American home has an average of $300 in unredeemed gift cards lying around, unused. These cards are either misplaced, accidentally thrown out, or only partially redeemed. You use part of it, stick the other back, and then you forget what, how much is on You know, we do that. Forget how much is on there. It's like, oh, I don't know. So, According to this report, it for, for six years, between 2005 and 2011, $41 billion in gift cards went unused. That's surprising. <laughs> $41 billion in gift cards went unused. That, that just blows my mind. It's amazing, isn't it? What good is a gift card if it's never used? What good is God's gift of His Son if you and I have not opened our hearts to His love Amen. and His Amen. grace? Amen. While it blows our mind that people would keep a gift card and not use it, and, and that over a period of six years, $41 billion worth has not been used in gift cards. We think they're stupid. But yet, how many of us don't take advantage of God's gift to us? And we remain spiritually stupid. Because God has come down in Jesus Christ. God humbled Himself in our behalf. Humanity has been lifted up and salvation has come near. You see, where the horizontal and the vertical intersect, there is the cross of Jesus Christ. It's where it happens. Where the horizontal and the vertical intersect, there is the cross. Of Jesus Christ. A famous artist painted a picture of the nativity and in his painting across the crib falls the shadow of the cross. I don't know if you can see it very well. I tried to find a picture of that. But it just kind of depicts for us that salvation is God's eternal plan for humanity. And that's why he has come down. That's why we have been lifted up. Heaven and earth have intersected at the cross of Calvary through this babe of Bethlehem. So we then are the recipients of a great free gift. And that's why it's right for Christmas to be a time of gift giving because it represents we are the recipients of the greatest gift of all. The babe of Bethlehem. The God of all creation has become the babe of Bethlehem. The babe of Bethlehem became the lamb of Calvary that takes away the sin of the world. And because of the divine drama of which the stable of Bethlehem was only a part of it, our salvation has been made possible. It has come near. Salvation. God's salvation has come to us. It was in our behalf that God humbled Himself. And, and the salvation that He offers is free to everyone who would receive it. It's free. We don't have to 
do something grandiose in order to earn our salvation. There's no material gift that we can offer the Christ child in return for what God has done for us. Nothing. We're, we're kind of like the young guy who was out off to college and he couldn't get home for Christmas, so he sent his dad a set of inexpensive cufflinks and a, a matching tie class. And along with this inexpensive gift, he sent a little note that said, Dear Dad, I know this isn't much, but it's all you could afford. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, think about that. You see, when we try to offer something material to God, or something derived from, our, from what we can drum up, our own accomplishments, God must just smile with appreciation and, and understanding. But the gift He offers us is totally, unconditionally free. There are no strings attached. There are no strings attached. There's only one gift that we can offer Him in return, and that is to receive the gift that He offers us. Receive it. God has humbled Himself and come down in Jesus Christ. Humanity has been lifted up. Salvation has drawn nigh. All we have to do is receive it joyfully and make it our own and claim it as our life. That's all. So, where God and humanity intersect, that's where we find the cross. So Advent reminds us that what we're waiting for, the salvation of God, has come to us. Have you received Him? Is He yours? Does He belong to you? Do you belong to Him? Have you received Him? Th that is our gift. To receive Him and then live for Him. That's our gift to Him. May God help me to live that life. May God help you to live that life. Let's pray together. Father, thank You for Your Word. Thank You for Your gift. Thank you for this wonderful time of year. Lord, we are an expectant people, Lord. And for sure, at, at Christmas, we're, we're like little children who, who look at the season with sparkling eyes as if we've seen the greatest gift in the world. Let us, like the children, become so excited about the baby in the manger, born to show us your will, to, to share with us your love, and to tell us that your kingdom has come to us, and that we can be, that, that, that can be shared through us with the entire world. Thank you, Lord, that, that Christ's coming is not just some distant event that took place in the obscure place long ago but something that repeats itself again and again and comes alive in us every year. How we rejoice that the living Spirit of the Lord guides us in faith every day, walks with us through every valley, stands with us in all, the, in all of our upright living, whispers to us like a still small voice and abides in our hearts and minds with, with the vision and hope of things eternal. Thank you, Lord, that in this sacred season we are moved from carelessness to thoughtfulness, from selfishness to giving, from being hard and callous to being kind and gentle, from indifference to concern, all because of you. So I pray, Lord, you would let such a spirit abide with us, not just in this season, but throughout the journey of life. So now I ask that you would make, make our souls a manger wherein the, the Lord of life is born again. 
And as Susie said earlier, heaven's child is ours. And may we give back by accepting, receiving, and accepting your gift and giving back to you our life. Live according to your will. I pray this in your holy name. Well, stand with me, please, if you will, and receive the benediction this morning. Brothers and sisters in Christ, what a joy it is to be able to worship and fellowship together. And I'm thankful we have this place together. Amen. Amen. Together. To encourage each other. Amen. To rejoice with each other along the way. Yes. So, People of God, go from here today energized to serve faithfully and lovingly in the days of this week. And may we live in the light of God's redemptive love. And may we share that love with whoever we come in contact with. And may we speak the name of Jesus often and lovingly in his name. And may the peace of Christ be with you all. Thank you. You are dismissed. God bless you.